Hello YouTube, Sidekick here with another installment of the Iron Bomber's Guide to the Galaxy. We're continuing our look at the little iron bomber that could, the A4. Today, uh, we're going to do a little bit of a mission reenactment, but before we do that, we're going to talk about the scooter uh, in Vietnam, and specifically about uh, Operation Rolling Thunder, and we'll talk a little bit about, uh, obviously, the missions that uh, the A4 performed, the threats that they faced, and then we're going to do uh, kind of a reenactment of a mission, which we'll start with a briefing, and then we'll go fly it in DCS. So, let's get started. Operation Rolling Thunder was the name of the U.S. air campaign against North Vietnam that lasted from March 1965 to October 1968. The ultimate aim of Rolling Thunder was to convince the government of North Vietnam to negotiate an end to the conflict in the South, and it ultimately failed in this objective. Now, literally buckets of ink have been spilled on the topic of Rolling Thunder, and I don't really want to wade into the waters of why it failed, um, or who is at fault for what. There are plenty of sources around if you want to explore that topic. I'd rather focus here on how our protagonist, the A4, uh, played its part in the conflict, and also how Rolling Thunder affected the future of air-to-ground combat and the tactics, techniques, and procedures used by combatants and also the design of it, the aircraft themselves, including the A-4. Because, in effect, over the four years of Rolling Thunder, uh, air combat kind of uh, moved from about the 1950s, uh, really, into the modern day. At the start of Rolling Thunder, not all that much had changed since World War II. Aircraft were basically armed with unguided bombs, and they were opposed by anti-aircraft artillery, which was aimed with the aid of radar, but whose projectiles were unguided. Uh, it all meant that for both air and ground, the ratio of practical effect to effort expended was pretty small. One American pilot famously said that it would have been way cheaper to buy a truck from the North Vietnamese rather than spend the money on the bombs that were typically needed to destroy one. Similarly, the vast majority of AAA ammunition mainly contributed light in the form of tracer rounds rather than heat in the form of deadly impact. At the beginning, aircraft operated with impunity at high altitudes and either dropped their bombs from these altitudes with not much more accuracy than a B-17 over Germany, or they dove on the target and attempted a more pinpoint strike but as any of us who have tried to drop iron bombs with iron sights will attest, dropping a bomb within its lethal radius of a point target requires both skill and practice, and that's even when no one is trying to kill you. All of that began to change with the deployment of the first surface-to-air missiles in 1966. Suddenly, high altitude was no longer a safe haven. Uh, but also, because SAMs had effective guidance from launch to target, they were much more efficient at bringing aircraft down. So, new countermeasures were required. Now, these not only involved modified tactics, like flying at lower altitudes, but also new weapons, such as jammers to fool the radars and anti-radiation missiles to target them. This, of course, led to responses from the other side, to find ways to penetrate jamming and to fool or destroy the anti-radiation missile. And as Rolling Thunder progressed, North Vietnam also began deploying interceptors, at first MiG-17s and then the much more effective MiG-21. The U.S. responded by increasing the amount of combat air patrol sorties that accompanied the bombing strikes and by bringing new aircraft such as the F-4 into the fight. By the end of Rolling Thunder, both sides were using increasingly sophisticated tactics and weapons. U.S. strikes frequently involved many more aircraft in supporting roles, such as ECM, flak suppression, and combat search and rescue, than were actually involved in striking the target. The North Vietnamese, in turn, honed their signals intelligence, camouflage, and deception plans to try and stay one step ahead of the attackers. The U.S. was also beginning serious experimentation with new systems that would allow aircraft to deliver even unguided weapons from a distance, such as bombing computers, and also precision-guided munitions that actually could be guided all the way to their target. 
By the end of 1968, the air war over North Vietnam was looking a lot less like the air war over Nazi Germany and a lot more like the kind of modern combat that we think of today. In the end, the U.S. Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps flew over 300,000 sorties over North Vietnam during Operation Rolling Thunder. They dropped 850,000 tons of bombs, which exceeded the total tonnage dropped in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Of this, the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps were responsible for just about half of the total, and they lost about 410 aircraft. On the other side, it's estimated that Rolling Thunder bombing resulted in the deaths of more than 20,000 Vietnamese. Today, we're going to recreate what it might have been like to fly a typical mission for a squadron of A-4s during the height of Rolling Thunder in the summer of 1967. The squadron in question is VA-163, known as the Saints, and in 1967, they were aboard the carrier USS Oriskany, part of Task Force 77 off the coast of North Vietnam. So, let's go there now. Operation Rolling Thunder continues. Task Force 77 is operating from Yankee Station and will launch strikes into the Route Package 4 of North Vietnam. USS Oriskany squadrons will fly a range of missions today. VA-163 will contribute three strike packages. The enemy continues to oppose Rolling Thunder through the use of radar-guided SAMs, AAA guns of all calibers, MiG-17 and MiG-21 interceptors all supplied by the Soviets. Resistance in the Route Package 4 area is expected to be moderate, as increasing USAF focus on Route Package 6 seems to be drawing SAM and MiG forces away from the coast in our target area. VA-163 will attack the oil storage and transshipment facility at the listed coordinates. VA-163 will be split into three strike packages. A Wild Weasel SAM suppression package, four ship, call sign Jackknife, a Flak suppression package, for ship, call sign Switchblade, and a main attack package for a ship, call sign Bloodhound. The strike will proceed as follows. Call sign Jackknife will precede the other two elements and identify and engage any SAM north and east of the target area. Switchblade will suppress known flak concentrations to the west of the target and then engage targets of opportunity. Bloodhound will attack the target from the east and egress west using the corridor cleared by Switchblade. Bloodhound will launch an RV with Switchblade and proceed to checkpoint Joker. Bloodhound will turn south and go over the beach at Point Whiskey at 14,000 feet. Pick up the target off your port wing and begin an approach to bring you to your initial point at 12,500 feet. Roll in and ingress to the target from the east. Stay high over the target and drop ordnance at 4,000 feet or above. I suggest you use your bombing computers and pick an aim-off mark at least 1,500 feet from the target. Have a look at the air photo. There are a lot of candidates, I think. Then continue to dive out to the west, preserve speed, and use the corridor cleared by switchblade. Once your feet are wet, climb back up to 10,000 feet and RV at checkpoint Joker for the return flight. Bomb loadout for call sign Bloodhound will be three Mark 83 bombs carried on the center pylons. 150 gallon drop tanks will be carried on pylons 2 and 4. Time of target is 1536. You should be crossing Whiskey at 1531. Step to your jets at 1300. Launch operations start at 1331 with Jackknife, followed by Switchblade, and then us. Good luck, gentlemen. I'll see you tonight for the debrief. Okay, sidekick here. We're over the target. Just taking a quick look. I think a Bloodhound and Switchblade uh, are just departing Joker and getting ready uh, to do their ingress over the coast. So uh, we'll just go jump in the cockpit with Bloodhound. Alright, uh, looks like we're clear of Joker. Switchblade's on his way in. Just got to go south down the coast here a little bit. 
and pick up checkpoint whiskey. Uh, get ourselves fenced in now that we're uh, coming to the coast. Gonna drop all three bombs in a ripple. I use the bombing computer. They're all in the center pylon. All right, there's our landmarks down there. That little river. I just want to come in a little south of that. So we'll bend off a little to the south here. We've got it on the nav computer, so we can see where it is. There's the rest of Bloodhound there. All right, time to set the boys loose. All call signs Bloodhound. This is Bloodhound. Spread out and stay high over the coast. Remember to keep jinking once your feet are dry. This is Switchblade. Going feet dry. Okay. Now we're coming up on Whiskey. Overlord, this is Bloodhound. We are feet dry at Checkpoint Whiskey. Out. Okay, so we can see the target area over there. You gotta remember we gotta keep jinking. Don't need to fly wings all very long. Okay, so there's the river bend. I think I see the bridge and the targets in between those two. So, Switchblade, rolling in. Uh, we're good, we just need to keep coming around to the left here. Switchblade. Some good hits on targets in Zone Alpha and Zone Bravo. Hey, Bloodhound. Switchblade 4 owes you a beer for dropping his eggs in the river. So long as we keep turning back and forth, we should be all right. I mean, the, the idea of the jinking is, you know, if they're firing at us from 14,000 feet down, it takes a while for the shell to get up here. So long as we don't fly in a straight line for that long, then it won't matter if they're tracking us with radar. Okay, I can definitely... Uh, See the target area now, just on the other side of that green spit of land there. Switchblade, we're going around again. Okay, well, it sounds like Switchblade has uh, taken out at least some of the AAA on the far side of the river. So the idea is we're going to stay high on this side of the river. And then once we drop the bombs, we're just going to go like stink out the other side, not going to bother climbing up at losing speed. And we're going to hope that uh, they've taken out enough of the flak to keep it off us. Got to keep going back and forth here. There's still, there's pretty much flak wherever you fly in this part of the world. Okay, we're starting to get close to thinking about where we want to be for rolling in. Switchblade, the neighborhood is still pretty busy. We are rolling in on targets in Zone Charlie. Jinx a little shorter here just so we can get a good roll in. Coming around, it's the most dangerous part. Going to have to fly straight when we roll in, so don't want to take too long doing that. Bloodhound 1 rolling in. Alright, there we go. Pull it up to the target. It's a pretty shallow dive. And with the bombing computer, we should be alright. We need to pull it up past the target, though, so we can drop nice and high. And bomb's gone. Bloodhound, bombs away. Switchblade, some good hits in Zone Charlie, and we are off. Alright, now we really gotta be jinking. It is a busy neighborhood. Even with the stuff that Switchblade took out. Definitely do not want to be flying in a straight line at all down here. Bloodhound, we are off and going feet wet. See you at Joker. Out. Alright, well that was an exciting few minutes. I think we managed to get away. Looks like we got some good hits on the target. We'll have to get a BDA later. If you enjoyed this video, please uh, like it and subscribe to the channel. And for now, this is going to be Sidekick.